Good morning and welcome to worship. I uh, have a number of announcements uh, to make, just highlighting some on the sheet. Um, you see, Banside Church are um, having a series of studies. The journey to Jerusalem, the story of Jesus, the last days, all the details are there and I commend it to you. Also, can I commend being disciples learning together uh, in the church, uh, study exploring how Jesus calls us to be his disciples. And you will notice that Banside are involved and also one of the meetings is here uh, on the 3rd of March. So all the details are there, being disciples learning together. And I again commend this to you. Lent is a time when we think about the big questions um, about our lives in the light of Jesus' journey to the cross. So this is an opportunity of thinking through some of the bigger issues that um, we are faced by that journey to Jerusalem. <coughs> Next Sunday, the 25th, 3 p.m., is the GB praise service. Everyone's going to be welcome. I hope to be um, here myself uh, with Dr. Gray being away, uh, John Davy and myself. John is conducting worship in Bandside uh, this morning. He will be here next week and I will be in, in Bandside. But we're looking forward to that uh, praise service and tea in the church hall afterwards as we celebrate um, the anniversary of the GB that has always had such an important part to play in the life of this church and community. Also note the food bank appeal. Um, the other announcements I leave you to read for yourselves. The psalmist says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love lasts forever. <coughs> Let us worship God. <coughs> Let us pray. Almighty God, we acknowledge that everything has its origin in you. You spoke and the universe came into being. You spoke and gave form and purpose to its life. At your word, men and women of old began in faith to discover your truth. In Jesus, your word became flesh, and the full extent of your loving purpose was revealed. Through him, you called together the first disciples and enabled them to receive the Holy Spirit, molding them into your church. We believe that you speak still, calling people like us into your service. Open our minds and our hearts to what you're saying to us now, that we may more clearly understand your purpose and more truly serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening praise is, My Jesus, My Saviour. mistake is that I didn't turn on the microphone, but I suspect you can hear me anyway. 
Let's pray. <coughs> Almighty God, we are small in mind, short in understanding, limited in vision, living careful, finite lives. You are a great God who knows and sees and understands all things. You love immensely and forever. We pause at the beginning of our worship to be still and acknowledge that you alone are God. You created the universe with a word. We see your glory in all that you've made. Especially on this day, we get a sense of moving out of winter slowly into spring. We see your glory in all that you've made. Yet our belief is challenged on every side, sometimes by our own bitter experience, often by the corrosive secularism that is the spirit of our age. Renew us in faith and hope. Enable us to give ourselves with renewed vision and energy to the tasks that you give us. You've set us in a vast and wonderful universe. All around us we see beauty, yet we're absorbed by the things that do not last. We find it a struggle to set our hearts on the very things that give us a sense of purpose and meaning. Widen our horizons and deepen our understanding and help us to see how much we owe to others and how much we take them for granted. We give thanks for every good thing in our lives. For teachers who inspired us. For that first job that began our working career. And those who mentored us and shared insights. We remember friends who have shared our lives and helped us in good days and bad. Renewing our confidence. Or bringing us down to earth if that's what we needed. We give thanks for your church family. Helping us find a moral compass in a world that is so contradictory and encourages selfishness as an art form. Remember the quiet yet persistent example of those church members who have often unknown to themselves helped us choose the right course when we were conflicted or confused. Who wept with us in our times of sorrow and rejoiced with us in our successes. Most of all, we give thanks for the faith that shapes our lives. You are the author and finisher of faith. It is your gift from first to last. We give thanks that you reveal yourself in the history of your people Israel. In the fullness of time, you came in Jesus Christ. And we give thanks that he is a perfect copy of your nature. Therefore, we can see what you are like in him. We give thanks for his ministry, death and resurrection. He shows your boundless love. We thank you for all the hope and strength and courage he gives. That we might live as you intend. Recreate us in the image of Jesus and renew us by your Holy Spirit. As we pray using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, if the boys and girls will come and meet me at the front. Good morning. Now, when I was your age, money was much more complicated than it is now. Now, there are a hundred pennies in every pound. But when I was your age, there were 
240 in a pound. And instead of there being 5p, 10p, 20p, 50p, there were all sorts of different coins. There was a threepenny bit, there was a sixpence, or a tanner, there was a shilling, or a bob, there was two shillings, or a florin, and there was a half crown. But in February 1971, the government decided to make it much easier for you, and they reduced the pound to 100 pennies to simplify it. Now, I remember when I was in the Cubs and the Scouts, we talk about 5p, a shilling, or a bob. There was Bob a job week, and you used to get a card, and you went round to your friends and neighbours, and you did odd jobs for them. You did the wash the car, cut the grass, wash the windows, do whatever was required, and you got a bob in return. 5p wasn't much, was it? Then they decided to change the name from Bob a Job Week just to Job Week to encourage people to give more. This is up. Now, all the grandpas and grandmas know what that is. If, anyway, if you have any idea what it is, well, there are 20 shillings in a pound. If there are 20 shillings in a pound, and that says 10 shillings, how much is it worth in today's money? You didn't know you were going to have to, uh, to do all your maths today. Well, they got in Scarva. They're very intelligent in Scarva. How much is that worth in today's money? No, not a tenner. No, well, no, no. But that was a good guess. It says 10 on it, but what, 10 what? No, look. See, we all grew up with pounds and shillings and so on. And this generation hasn't the faintest idea about uh, shillings and all the various bits, half crowns and so on. No, that's worth the equivalent of 50p. Now, the lowest value note that we have today is five pounds. But when I was your age, that was the lowest value note and it was 10 shillings. And I want to tell you a story about my dad and the 10 shilling note. In his car, in the glove compartment, he had his license. And in the back of his license, he put a 10 shilling note. Right? And when we were your age, we were told, on no account are you to touch the 10 shilling note because that was his emergency money. So if someday he had uh, not got his wallet with him and he needed to buy petrol, he had a 10 shilling note in the front of the car and he was able to buy the petrol he needed. It was his emergency money. Imagine going with 50p now and trying to buy petrol at a petrol station. <laughs> but it stayed in his car for year after year after year, even when they changed the money, he never took the 10 shilling note out of the car. Mind you, he couldn't use it by then. But there's something very important that I want to share with you this morning, and it's this. His 10 shilling note was his emergency money, for emergency use only. And you know, sometimes that's the way that we look at prayer, for emergency use only. When we're in trouble, and we say, Lord, I'm in serious trouble here. I need help. And there's nothing wrong with asking God's help when we're in trouble. But if we only use prayer for emergencies, we haven't got much of a relationship with God. If you didn't talk to your friends, soon they wouldn't be friends anymore. You need to keep in contact with your friends, and we need to keep in contact with God. And we do it through our prayer, where we say, Thank you for all the good things that God has done for us. When we say sorry for the mistakes we've made. And when we pray for other people who are going through difficult times. And when we, in our turn, listen to what God wants to say to us. Prayer is so important. It's not just for emergency use only. Let's pray. 
loving God, it is good for us to know that you are there when our lives are in trouble, when we cry to you and say, Lord, help us. But help us build our relationship with you through our prayer to say thank you and sorry and seeking your help for other people that our relationship with you will grow stronger and stronger, our friendship with you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing, The Wise May Bring Their Learning. Testament lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, reading from the 11th chapter. The reading is Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 11, and found on page 16 of the Pew Bible. The Messengers from John the Baptist. When Jesus finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he left that place and went off to teach and preach in the towns near there. When John the Baptist heard in prison about the things that Christ was doing, he sent some of his disciples to him. Tell us, they asked Jesus, are you the one John said was going to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus answered, go back and tell John what you are hearing and seeing. The blind can see, the lame can walk, those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases are made clean. The deaf hear, and the dead are brought back to life, and the good news is preached to the poor. How happy are those who have no doubts about me. While John's disciples were leaving, Jesus spoke about him to the crowds. When you went out to see Joseph, sorry, when you went out to John in the desert, what did you expect to see? A blade of grass bending in the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed up in fancy clothes? People who dress like that live in palaces. Tell me, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, indeed. But you saw much more than a prophet. 
For John is the one of whom the scripture says, God said, I will send my messenger ahead of you to open the way for you. I assure you that John the Baptist is greater than anyone who has ever lived, but the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Thank you, John. Let us worship God with our offering. Let us pray. Lord, bless the money that we give now. Help us within this congregation to use it wisely for the extension and the upbuilding of your people and your kingdom. Help us use all the gifts we've been given, not just the money that we offer now, that we can see ways that we can bring in your kingdom by the kind of people that we are. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of the prophet Zechariah. The reading is from Zechariah chapter 8 verses 1 to 17 and found on page 918 of the Pew Bible. The Lord promises to restore Jerusalem. The Lord Almighty gave this message to Zechariah. I have longed to help Jerusalem because of my deep love for her people, a love which has made me angry with her enemies. I will return to Jerusalem, my holy city, and live there. It will be known as the faithful city, and the hill of the Lord Almighty will be called the sacred hill. Once again, Old men and women, so old that they use a stick when they walk, will be sitting in the city squares, and the streets again will be full of boys and girls playing. This may seem impossible to those of the nation who are now left, but it's not impossible for me. I will rescue my people from the lands where they have been taken, and will bring them back from east and west to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be their God, ruling over them faithfully and justly. Have courage. You are now hearing the same words the prophet spoke at the time the foundation was being laid for rebuilding my temple. Before that time, no one could afford to hire either man nor animals, and no one was safe from his enemies. I turned people against one another, but now I am treating the survivors of this nation differently. They will sow their crops in peace, their vines will bear grapes, the earth will produce crops, and there will be plenty of rain. I will give all these blessings to the people of my nation who survive. People of Judah and Israel, in the past, foreigners have cursed one another by saying, may the same disasters fall on you that fell on Judah and Israel. But I will save you, and then those foreigners will say to one another, may you receive the same blessings that came to Judah and Israel. So have courage and don't be afraid. The Lord Almighty says, when your ancestors made me angry, I planned disaster for them and did not change my mind, but carried out my plans. But now 
I am planning to bless the people of Jerusalem and Judah. So don't be afraid. These are the things you should do. Speak the truth to one another. In the courts, give real justice, the kind that brings peace. Do not plan ways of harming one another. Do not give false testimony under oath. I hate lying, injustice and violence. May God bless to us these readings of his word. And to his name be glory and praise, time without end. Amen. On Friday we heard of the death of Alexei Navalny in a prison camp in Siberia for daring to challenge the rule of Putin. The Russian state had already tried to kill him using Novichok. He had gone to uh, Germany for treatment and he was advised not to go back to Russia <coughs> because he would likely be arrested and he was arrested immediately he returned and then was imprisoned for 19 years in the most severe prison camp that exists in Russia. Uh, he leaves behind a wife Yulia and a son and a daughter. He was 47 years old but for sheer courage there are a few better examples in our world. I want to pray for um, his family, but I also want to use the opportunity of thinking of those prisoners of conscience that exist all around the world um, who speak truth to power and who often end up uh, with all sorts of difficulties. Especially I want to remember members of the Christian church. We take it for granted that we can come without let or hindrance on a Sunday morning. There are many parts of the world where that's not possible, uh, where coming to church is deemed to be being in opposition to the state. I want to pray in particular for those in our church who are facing persecution and those who face uh, persecution because of the color of their skin or their political or religious views. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give thanks for the sheer courage of Alexei Navalny being prepared to challenge the Russian state and set forward a better way before the people. We hear this morning that 400 have been arrested because they came out in support of him after his death on Friday. We pray for his wife, Yulia, his son and his daughter. And we remember all those who are prisoners of conscience, can think of parts of the world where the church is illegal, North Korea, or where church people, followers of Jesus, are in all sorts of difficulty in a village where neighbors fall out and a member of the church is involved and they're accused of blasphemy and end up in front of the courts and imprisoned if not facing death. We remember all those parts of the world like Sudan, Nigeria, where churches are under pressure, where violence is an ever-present reality. We pray for those who are imprisoned because of their political beliefs or the color of their skin or the religious beliefs. In our turn, we remember how much we owe to those who stand up for faith. As we think of Russia this morning, we remember the violence that was unleashed on Ukraine by Putin, an illegal war. We remember those Russian forces who are sent to fight, who have got no other option, and who are being killed and injured in large numbers. We pray for those in Ukraine. We see the devastation of their cities, forces again facing death and injury. And we pray for those who have been bereaved. And we pray 
for those who seek a way forward. Loving God, remember the violence in Gaza where the innocent seem to be paying the price. When more than half of the homes have been reduced to rubble, when hospitals are no longer functioning properly, when people are living in the open, in tents, where food is in short supply and medical help is rare. And we pray for your peace. We pray for a ceasefire, that aid can freely enter Gaza, that the hostages will be freed, and that the international community can come together and seek a way forward for the good of all in that area, Israeli and Palestinian alike. We pray for peace. We pray for our own community where the executive has been reformed and ministers are getting to grips with their particular briefs. We remember that in the days that lie ahead, there will be many difficulties that have to be overcome. And we pray that all in the executive will work for the good of the whole of our community. We pray for those who are overworked in our community, overset staff and A&E, teachers expected to be social workers, probation officers whose caseloads are overwhelming and who are first to be blamed when things go wrong. Remember those who lack the dignity of work or who feel their work is mundane and without value. Loving God, we remember those who have been plunged into grief because of the loss of someone close to them. Those who are waiting for the results of tests and who worry about what the tests will reveal. For those whose hopes have been dashed because of a breakdown in a relationship or estrangement from family. Those who didn't get the job they had set their heart on. Those who feel unappreciated and overlooked. Loving God, guide and strengthen us to be the people you call us to be in Christ. For in his name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn was written by an American Quaker. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways.
Let us imagine, as you leave church this morning, a poster from Gallup or any of the other polling organizations stops you and asks you the question, why have you come to church this morning? You, of course, will immediately say, well, we come for the preaching. We get up on Sunday morning and we say, great, it's Sunday, I wonder what the sermon is going to be about today. Or have I got that wrong? What other reason might you give for coming to church that is part of the very warp and weft of your being? Because it's an essential part of the structure of every week? Because as one of uh, my former members put it when answering this very question, because I desperately need to come. Do you come because you need to be healed and restored after the battering that life hands out to us every week? Do you come to have the good in you reinforced to catch your breath for the week ahead? Do you come here because you feel part of a community and you have a sense of belonging? Second question might be because posters never just ask one question. What do you value in the church? Well, your answer might be friendship. Or you value what the church stands for, various aspects of its ministry. One of my former members was a cantankerous 90-something-year-old who constantly criticized me and the church. I used to stand at his door when I went to visit him, and before I pressed uh, the doorbell, I used to pray and say, Lord, you know, don't let me lose my temper in here. And particularly, don't let me suggest that he slings his hook and goes and joins some other congregation. But the complaint was never-ending. And then one day, I said to him, look, why if we constantly and continue to get everything wrong, why do you want to be part of the church? He said, because I believe there's an eternal battle between right and wrong, and the church is on the side of the right. Incidentally, when he died, I discovered that he had fallen out with virtually everybody else, which made me feel a little bit better. Then the pollster asked for your approval rating. Well, you might say the church is doing well, but there are one or two things that you would change. What if the pollster asked, do you believe that the church is God's chosen instrument to bring in his kingdom? This is a kingdom where the poor are given opportunity, where the hungry are fed, when races and religions are reconciled into authentic community. Where the wolf lies down with the lamb and where no one is afraid. It's a kingdom where the sinner is forgiven and heartaches are finally healed. It's a kingdom where children grow up to find genuine ways of fulfillment. Where work is filled with sacred meaning and purpose and when it's clear that God is in our midst. Because that is why the church exists. That's what the church is about. Yet often we see the church as there to meet our needs. And what this generation seems to ask of the church is, what can you offer me? When the word of the Lord came onto the prophet Zechariah, it had been a couple of generations since the people of Israel had returned from the Babylonian captivity. The temple had been rebuilt because earlier prophets had given those returning exiles a great dream of the coming day of the Lord. It would be, they promised, a day of justice and restoration. And those who heard the prophets in those days became excited and were invested in rebuilding the temple and its ministry. But that was 65 years before Zechariah. The Lord's kingdom was slow in coming. 
The excitement of the earlier dream had now died down by the time we get to their grandchildren. And life for the Jews had become mundane and drab and ordinary. In the words of the prophet Zechariah, it was a day of small things. The dreams that once burned in the hearts of their grandparents of returning to a homeland and building a city and a temple those dreams had grown cold. The city that was once the capital of great King David was now a minor administrative center in the great Persian Empire. The walls of the city were crumbling and filled with huge gaps. The priests in the newly restored temple were bored and without vision. It is always a day of small things when people lose the vision that unites them. I wonder, could it be said about this generation that we live in a day of small things? It's an important issue. Churches seem to be concerned with their own needs, ministering to their own members. And maybe we've lost a sense of what we've been called to do, to bring in the kingdom. A number of years ago, PCI produced a video called Made in China. And it told of our mission in Manchuria in China between the mid-19th century and the mid-20th century. It told of the 91 missionaries and their families who went and the work they did, setting up churches, schools, hospitals, some of which exist to this day. It told of the human cost, sometimes missionaries and their families dying only weeks after arriving. The work was arduous. Often in the face of opposition, there was political instability. Missionaries often had to travel hundreds of miles on foot. And as you look at the pictures of the early missionaries in particular, they look unsmiling and determined. People who traveled to the end of the known world, knowing all the risks, not least of isolation and loneliness, because they were convinced they were bringing in the kingdom. They were part of a church that looked outwards and was determined to change the world. They saw themselves as part of a great cause. Well, what about us? Do we see the church in the same way? Some would say we are now living in a day of small things. And if you want to work out whether that is true for you, what keeps you up awake at night? Do you worry about paying next month's credit card bill? Do you worry about getting the promotion you think is your due? Do you lie awake wondering how you're going to respond to some slight that you think has been given to you? Try and find a way of putting off a visit to some member of the family you don't get on with are the things that keep you awake at night essentially small things well how do we move from days of small things to helping bringing in the kingdom well the first thing to do is to acknowledge that we are the church over my ministry as I have talked to members of congregations. It's amazing how often they say to me, your church. It's not my church. It's not the church of the session or the leadership. It is our church because we're all part of the people of God. If we say your church, then we can sit in judgment and criticize what we see as the failings in the church. We can sit in judgment. We expect them to deliver what we want and complain if they don't. But that's not how it works. We're all in this together. We all have a part to play. Every single one of us has skills and abilities that can be used to bring in the kingdom. A movement called Redeeming the Community began in Manchester when people from a number of different congregations got together because of their concern with 
levels of crime and particularly violent crime. And they asked local police chiefs to come and talk to them. And the first thing they said to the police was, we value the work that you do. In fact, they organized posters to go up in every police station thanking the police for their work. The police chiefs, they were able to tell them about the challenge they were facing. There was a greater understanding of the work of the police and congregations were more focused on what they needed to pray for. They were much more involved in the community. There was a change in the relationship between the churches and the police. And funnily and amazingly, there was a reduction in crime. But they didn't only invite police chiefs, they invited those in the health service leadership to come and talk to, about the health service and the challenge that they were facing, or leaders in local government. Now, this was a church initiative, coming together of churches to pray. But every single one of us can use our prayer to make the kingdom real. Or, as I was saying earlier, is our prayer for emergency use only? Or do we see prayer as somebody else's responsibility? In Matthew's Gospel, we read of the disciples of John coming to Jesus, asking whether he was the Messiah. At one time, John was absolutely certain, but now he wasn't so clear. Jesus and John were two very different people. Jesus was not ascetic like John. He didn't fast like John. He didn't live on the desert margin. Now John himself was unable to come because he was in prison. So the disciples that he sent asked a very pointed question. Are you the one who is to come or do we look for another? Jesus didn't answer the question directly. He said, go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind regain their sight. The deaf hear. Lepers are healed. The dead are raised. The poor of the good news preached to them. Now these are the signs of the kingdom. The kingdom is not about what we say, it's about what we do. The kingdom comes when we live the values of the kingdom. When we forgive. When we're generous. When we try to set the right example to our children and grandchildren. When we put ourselves out to help other people. When we're kind and honest. The kingdom comes when we look around and see something that needs to be done that will help bring in the kingdom and don't suggest that somebody else might do it, but do it ourselves. There is something for every single one of us to do. All we have to do is look around. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, you call us to help bring in your kingdom. It's a kingdom begun in Christ. He told the disciples of John, come see here. And you call us to live the kingdom's values of integrity and forgiveness and grace. Strengthen us in that task and help us to see what we can do. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Courage, friend, and do not stumble, though your path be dark as night.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.